real pleasure to be able to uh, introduce Jordan Naidu, who I've known at least for a decade, maybe it's two decades. Kind of adds up when you're having fun. Um, Jordan Naidu uh, has had a very interesting career. Uh, let me start with the most recent aspect. He is senior advisor in education in UNICEF, based in New York, although as he was telling me a few minutes ago, he's never in New York. He's usually representing UNICEF in the many different areas that it is involved in, which are very many. Uh, uh, before that, uh, in fact, I thought before that was going to be getting his doctorate at Harvard Graduate School of Education, where some of our some of our friends here have uh, done work um, at, at Harvard in education, and uh, there was a life before that, and I learned that in my walk over here. Um, I, I didn't know this, that, I, mean, I knew that uh, George and I did was from South Africa, but I didn't know that was that, like many people his age, he was a, essentially a refugee during the apartheid era and spent a number of years here in the United States uh, uh, before returning to South Africa, just after uh, Mandela was released from prison, and uh, began work uh, toward his advanced studies in Natal, which is where he's from, in the big city of Durban, South Africa, and worked, uh, and we have some common friends from that era as well, worked on revising and revamping and understanding the new South Africa under Mandela and afterwards. Uh, but the afterwards didn't last. I mean, after he got his doctorate in the mid-90s at Harvard, he then uh, was hired by uh, the first of the international organizations to want to have him work for them, and that was Save the Children. And that is where I think we first met was in your role at Save the Children. And he was saying to me, and this is something I think for some of you who are interested, I know there's people here interested in working for international organizations, one of the liabilities is not only that you often live out the suitcase, uh, but also, he hasn't been able to work in South Africa for, I guess, the last dozen years or so because he's busy working in other countries. And that's an interesting thing to think about if you're uh, interested in international work. Uh, so he worked in SAVE Children during a period when SAVE expanded uh, fairly dramatically and, has had a, uh, and most recently has had an important role in uh, what his topic will be today, that is around education and equity. Most recently, we've been in contact because he's represented UNICEF on a number of bodies, such as the Global Partnership for Education, the Brookings Task, Task Forces on the post-2015 Millennium Development Goals. You all know, many of you know, that the Millennium Development Goals officially end in 2015. Many international organizations like UNICEF are deeply involved in what will happen next. Uh, so I said to him today that um, part of his responsibility is not just to talk technically about what he said he would be talking about, uh, but also to discuss uh, what's happening in the United Nations, UNICEF, around education, around the post-2015 MDGs, and, um, and maybe start off with maybe a little bit of how you got to where you got. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Jordan tonight. Thank you. about uh, 35, 40 minutes, and then open for questions and answers. We won't run later than 1.15 or 1.30. I know I took a little bit more time than you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dan, for that introduction. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to add any, anything much more than what you've already added, uh, listed. But as Dan said, much of, I grew up in South Africa, and most of my, almost all of my schooling until my undergrad was in apartheid South Africa. Uh, so it's a bit, uh, I think, unusual for me to have ended up with a doctorate in Harvard, uh, given the trajectory. My, my mother was actually illiterate, and I lived, you know, so I would think I was the first member of my family that actually completed uh, uh, a degree to, to have gone to a higher education. Uh, but besides that, I think the, the whole experience in South Africa really has informed almost all of the work I've done since. Uh, and, and I think, in a way, uh, leading UNICEF's education and equity focus really connects with my own personal experiences. Uh, and I think that's very important 
uh, for any country, uh, particularly in education, that you know, and working for an international organization uh, that really is committed to the right of children to education and all rights. Uh, but it's a, it's about personal passion, uh, and I and I can talk a little bit about that a little later. Uh, just one other addition in terms of my uh, kind of professional experience, besides working for SAVE, I've done a lot of consultancies all over the world, uh, in between things, you know, for USA, uh, for Adaya, and others from Egypt to Nepal. And one of the things that, you know, may be interesting, as Dan said, uh, when I joined SAVE and stopped working in South Africa, I think the opportunity to work for a large international, either NGO or bilateral organization, a UN organization, it does really give you experiences in places you least sort of uh, thought you would be working. Almost all my work before 2004 was in Africa, in South Africa, up to Gambia. Uh, and actually, the first time I went to the East uh, was to Nepal in 2004 when I joined uh, Save the Children. So that's just a uh, big personal. One other thing, I worked uh, for a while before I went to school at Harvard uh, at an uh, NGO in Boston called the Center for Collaborative Education based at Northeastern. I was part of the design team working on a middle school reform design called the Turning Points and it's still being implemented uh, currently. So I have some US experience because we implemented it on 14 states. So that I think also uh, gave me another perspective working internationally. To come to today, what I will do is I'll go through very quickly uh, the C presentation, the simulation for equity in education uh, model. Uh, give you some background, go through what it was intended to do. I'm not going to go into the details, technical details of the model. And in any case, I did not do the technical details. We had a uh, consultant at that world who used to be at the education policy data center who's been working for UCEF as a consultant for the last 18 months, who did the nuts and bolts of the model. Uh, I worked with Harry Patronos on the conceptual framework of the model uh, and some of the rolling out and testing. So uh, I will give you an idea of what the model can do. We can do one or two kind of uh, practical things with it. But all of you, will be, I think, sent a link to the actual model and to the user guide. So whenever you get a chance to work on it on your own, and if you have questions, you could always come back to us. And we do have a few copies for those who are intensely interested in that guarding up here. <laughs> have to distribute later. So just to uh, give you the background to this particular initiative, about, I think uh, we had a new director, executive director appointed uh, around, I think, sometime in 2011. Uh, Mr. Tony Lake took over from Anne Veneman <coughs> as the executive director. And one of the first things he did was to kind of say that UNICEF had to refocus its program. This was in the context of a number of things happening at that time within the health sector at UNICEF, where they had been developing a model uh, that looked at specifically the issues of equity. They, uh, together with the World Bank, developed a model called MBB, Marginal Budgeting for Bottlenecks. And they had applied it to an, an analysis of the health sector to demonstrate that it was possible to do equity-based programming in a cost-effective way. And in fact, they, they demonstrated quite well that, that you could actually do more for the least advantage and yet save on the overall. So one of the things that that resulted in was that uh, was the question then was being asked, and this was the main finding from from the from the help work was you know uh, that you could serve the poorest groups. They did a major analysis in terms of how could you cover, and they also did an analysis of dividing by different countries uh, to be able to show that health interventions uh, to reach the, the even the most marginalized would be beneficial to the overall. Everybody benefits if you focus on the marginalized. 
add it to cost in a cost-effective way. But the challenge was, could we apply the MBE model to education? And some of us, and, and there was quite a lot of pressure within UNICEF coming up from uh, our executive director sits on the 13th floor, so you'll always hear people say, here comes the 13th floor again. There was a lot of pressure to, to actually uh, apply exactly the same model uh, to education. And, and the model has certain merits, certain benefits. Uh, I, I'll go into it a little later, but the model is, uh, the MBB model was initially designed on a model uh, called the Tanahashi model that was developed by a Japanese professor that looked at bottlenecks and barriers. Uh, and it has six kind of components, both in supply and demand, uh, going from, is, you know, and you will look at it in the language that if you think about it in a qualitative way, I think you would intuitively realize that it cannot be applied exactly the same way as it was applied in health to education. Yet within the discussions in UNICEF with the people who were responsible for the MBB, they were insistent that it could be done and it should be done because they wanted to have consistency across all sectors. Uh, but at that point, my director, Susan Durston, and a few of us in the education team were really sort of, they said we have to hold our ground because education is qualitatively different. Uh, if you look at the Tanahashi model, it has these six determinants moving from the lowest level of commodities uh, to human resources. Uh, the third one is accessibility, then utilize, initial utilization, continuing utilization, and coverage quality. So if you look at even some of the terminology, if you take commodities, for example, in health, you could very well I was trying to see if I could get that to go. Oh, you have a Yeah. Thanks. So, so the question is then, we, we, we felt we, had, we could use the MBB, but we needed to, to do it differently. So based on that, uh, we started looking at what could be done. And we came up with you know, the, the traditional models that were used in education at the time and are still used is you know, the Epson model developed by uh, IIT UNESCO to do costing for education planning. The World Bank has something similar that they use. There's uh, a model that has been developed, uh, a hype model by EPDC and others for the same kind of reason. But all of those, and, I, and I'll mention a bit of what the differences are. All of those models are based on projections uh, in terms of setting a target and delivery based on the individual cost. Looking at it, you know, if you want to reach 5,000 children at a certain point, then what you calculate backwards what, what the cost is. But we, in thinking about it, we, we felt that to address equities, because many of the equities are group-based inequities, uh, this, these, the current models would not work. So in, in, in sort of looking at people who had worked on it, and uh, coincidentally, the, at that time, the Global Monitoring Report of, uh, I think, 2011 was also, that report focused on marginalization. And a lot of the data for that had been provided, uh, some of the analysis by EPDC. So we contacted the EPDC at that point to look at whether they could use some of the data to try and help us rework the MVV model so that it would be appropriate to education. Uh, at that point, there was some, a number of issues going on with the Academy for Education Development, AD. They had been suspended by USAID, and so we couldn't employ EPDC. Uh, and you know, there was a change over EPDC was bought off by FHR. Uh, but at that point, the, the staff member of EPDC, Babette, who had been working with GMR, decided she would leave, which worked out great for UNICEF. So we employed her as an individual consultant. So from the beginning, we worked with Babette on sort of this conceptualization of a new model to also add. So, and I'll come back to that. Uh, at the same time, we were working with the World Bank on a broader agreement to do some work jointly. So, 
uh, they also was, were thinking about something. There was uh, an economist at the World Bank, uh, Emilio Pocha, who worked as part of that analysis team, was already looking at some kind of modeling. So it was a moment that worked for both of us. So Quebec, myself, Harry, and Emilio got together and said, let's try and pull apart MBB and see whether we can craft something that would be more appropriate to education. So on that basis, we said, well, let's see what are the questions we really want to answer with regard to education. So can we, can we use a model that would also then, you know, uh, and with an equity focus, will we be able to reduce inequality, but at the same time, improve some of the key uh, areas in education? And what we were really interested was not only to look at access, not only to look at the number of children that were being brought into school, but also see if the model could be responsive enough to also address the issue of learning. So this is another key difference between the MB, uh, MBB model, which largely looks at coverage of services, access to services. We were looking at quality beyond just access to look at whether it could uh, look at the cost in actually ensuring that more children learn. So, so therefore, the, you know, in summary, what we were trying to answer was, would an equity approach provide the lowest cost for reaching additional children, both in terms of just reaching them, but also ensuring that they learn. I'm going to move on. Maybe I covered the next two things. This, this clearly. Oh, one of the things I should have said is uh, the presentation. It doesn't exactly match what you have, and I would send this. But most of the slides are somewhere there, but they may be in different order. Uh, but some of this is just background material, so uh, don't worry about it. And I will send the updated uh, uh, slides to Lauren to share with you. Uh, but this just basically gives you the, the, the kind of things we did in developing the model. Uh, as I said, we were collaborating with the World Bank, the, the questions we were trying to answer. The other thing you see, something strange called Moors or Mores or whatever it is. Uh, over the last year or so, UNICEF also has been under a lot of pressure from donors and from others to be able to demonstrate much more uh, efficiently our contribution and attribution to certain results that we were claiming we were achieving. So as a result of that, the, concurrently to the MVB and our development of C in education, organizationally wide, they were developing what was called monitoring of results for equity systems. And they came up with you know, 10 determinants on uh, two each on the supply and demand side, then they added a couple of quality determinants and something around policy and enabling environment. Uh, and I won't go into de any detail on that, but I can provide you with some information. But since this Moore's activity was going on, we had to relook at our development of C to make sure that it aligned with Moore's. So we also incorporated the Moore's system into it. But the, this project timeline just gives you when we started. I think we started before September 2011. So basically, uh, it, it's about 18 months of development work with a couple of pilots. Uh, we did training and piloting in Burkina Faso and in Ghana, and then a group training in Senegal, but we also did something in Togo. Uh, a lot of the work happened in West Africa because our Ghana education officer, Hiro, uh, had already begun to think about some bottleneck analysis using MBB. In fact, they had the help folk come there and do some work. Uh, so we, we built on that. We also plan to do two more pilots. We've committed with the World Bank to do a pilot sometime in the next quarter in uh, Thailand and then in Cambodia or Vietnam. Again, uh, I'll just won't really talk to this, but this basically gives you the, the, the issues we try to cover. Uh, within UNICEF, the equity approaches, you will see OOS. Uh, the OSCI, 
We also concurrently have a partnership with UNESCO Institute of Statistics on an out-of-school initiative where they're doing studies in, or we have completed studies in about 26 countries that looks at a new framework for profiling out-of-school children. Uh, it's very much similar to what CREATE and the University of Sussex did, uh, a similar kind of study, but we sort of expanded that framework to include students who are in school but at risk of dropping out. So it tries to capture the entire out-of-school population to develop a new methodology. Uh, so it has both quantitative and qualitative components to it. So, so that's that. The other thing to say that the model sort of tries to look at children across the life cycle. So it could be applied from ECD levels to secondary school. But for now, the data and everything we've concentrated on in terms of the determinants is on primary education. But we have plans, we have a pilot with the Mexico country office on the secondary level in Mexico, Turkey, uh, Indonesia. I can't remember the top country. So just to go to the actual model, uh, it's it's fairly you know simple in some respects. <coughs> although the actual calculations and the, the uh, equations and so on behind it are, are fairly complex, but we try to keep it as simple as possible, at least for the front end user. Uh, so it would just mean some clicks, somebody in a uh, policy unit in a Ministry of Education would not need to have a lot of quantitative. Ink. Uh, skills, but could use it as a front-end user. Somebody who wanted to change a lot of it, I think basically you have to be uh, well-versed in Excel. It doesn't, doesn't require much more, except you would have to do uh, cleaning up of the data and so on. That part of it would need more quantitative skills. But to actually use it at the policy level, it's a fairly simple interface. It has basically, in a sense, four key components. One, uh, you know, or as you know, the, the write-up, and if you look at the user guide, calls it four building blocks. The four main building blocks, one, is the initial data on risk groups. You have to be able to know which risk groups you are trying to reach. For example, in Ghana, we focus on girls in the north as one risk, risk group. It would be or boys and girls in the north, uh, or we would choose maybe uh, the poorest girls in the north. So it depending, you have to identify your target group. And this was one key difference with the other models that I mentioned, like Epson and so on. The second, I think, key element of it, you have to have a group of interventions that you could propose. Now, this posed a real challenge, because in most of these countries, you don't have tried and tested interventions. Uh, so what do we do? We, we have to, in some senses, rely on interventions applied in other countries. But this raises a number of questions about the assumptions you're making. Because are they totally applicable from one context to the, the other? And we know they are not. And this was raised a number of times by a number of people. So to address that, there is some sensitivity analysis that will need to be done to ensure that you, you do have to have some confidence in terms of what interventions you choose. But then the problem still arose. For, you know, in health, over time, they have built up a big reservoir of uh, impact evaluation of various types. In education, it's been, you know, it's, it, there are very few uh, impact evaluations of many of the programs that we implement. Over the last 10 years, you know, j at MIT, a few others, it's been increasing. Uh, the World Bank have done a few over the years. So a big challenge in that area was to try and get together a list of evaluations. Uh, then the question was, are you only going to rely on you know, RCTs uh, or randomized controlled trials? And on the UNICEF side, we felt, fine, you need a report, that, but you have to also rely on some of the gray literature. You have to also include other types of studies uh, of programs that were evaluated. But we had a big debate with the World Bank on this. But, so we proceeded separately to continue to collect uh, a list of interventions. We have a paper, I don't have the link, but the World Bank, again, it took 
over a, uh, took, I think as long as 18 months, but about in December they finally managed to get together a synthesis of all these meta-evaluations. Uh, and they have created a database of evaluations you can draw on, interventions you can draw on to plug into the model. And UNICEF has something similar as well, but uh, I will provide the link. Then the uh, third one is the whole calculation. So in the model you will see a, a calculation page, but all of the calculations are built in. What, what needs to be done is entry of the data. So, and the fourth is the actual calculation of results and costs. The big problem and a, and a challenge we still face is that even though there's you know, many systems, most countries have EMA systems, uh, the reliability of the data is a big problem. And so one of the issues with this, you, have to, you are relying not only on EMIS data, you have to use uh, DHS, uh, household survey data, as well as UNICEF's own mix, uh, multi-cluster survey information, or any others. In most cases, you will need census population data. And often the data doesn't match. You know, it's from different years and so on. So that's a big challenge. I think the biggest challenge in using C is actually the availability and cleaning up of data so that you can actually use it. Maybe a, one clarification question, because it may sure. not be clear to people. Um, you mentioned a little earlier that the purpose of this, uh, or the target user, might be somebody in a Ministry of Education. Is that right? Sure. So is this designed, is C, the acronym and the simulation, designed to help policymakers decide whether to use particular interventions and look at the results for the most marginalized people. That's the general purpose. Right. So, so uh, I think that's a really important point, and, and I'm glad you made that. And actually, even in the piloting, when we chose uh, uh, people around the table, we had both in Ghana and the King of so and we, had we started the process in, in Ghana, for uh, in uh, Nigeria. In, in Ghana, for example, we have people from the ministry, from the English section, but we also have people from the planning section. We have people from the Ghana Education Service. Uh, because in a way, essentially, we didn't, we think of this as a policy dialogue tool to make certain, to inform decisions. So it's not, we don't see it as a, as an econometric exercise. More so, and it, and it doesn't prescribe things because there's still decisions to be made. And one of the things that I did not say is, although we've, we've got one page that can allow you to do that, but there needs to be a much more detailed analysis before you even start using C on a, a bottleneck and barrier analysis and some of the causes of the key bottlenecks to that. So there's a, there's a prior stage before actually doing the data and entering the data and then you know, getting your results and then having this discussion. Because eventually, the the, the modeling doesn't tell you what to do. There's some policy choices will be, have to be made based on the results that are generated from the modeling. I think that's kind of the, the process. So this just purely gives you some of the, what we uh, determined are the characteristics. And I'm just going to go through that. Yeah, and I think the, the point you were making uh, is actually, yeah, that B, this is where we see it being used. And one of the things that I, I perhaps omitted to say, the, the model has been designed in such a way that it can be used nationally, it can be used subnationally, it can even we have plans for it to be used at, at a local sub-district sub level, or even possibly even at a school level if it's adapted further. But it's at least been adapted by the education chief in Ghana for a district level planning exercise. So, uh, you know, and, and in UNICEF we do the situational analyses to inform our country program the designs every four or five years, depending on the country. So we see, see also helping in that situational analysis process, together with the other activities that we're carrying out, such as the bottleneck, the MOS, and other analyses. We also see it as being used, as I say, for us, the primary one is the policy dialogue. So one of the plans we have is to uh, actually do capacity building with our country officers and with government counterparts as a rollout once the next two pilots have been uh, finished. And just to say, one of the things, I've been the program manager, in a sense, for this project. 
but uh, I'm sort of handing over. We've just employed uh, uh, an economist who used to be at the World Bank, and he has actually taken over the project and starting training and the next pilot. So I won't have anything more to do with this for the next uh, however long. Uh, so again, it can be a monitoring tool, and it can be even used, I think, by by a by an NGO to look at its own programming, the efficacy of its program. If it's deciding on a particular intervention, they can project it. It just depends on what data you have available to plug it into the model. And actually, uh, while we were piloting in Ghana, uh, DFID, uh, the British Development Agency, was planning its new five-year cycle of its adept, uh, adept alternative basic education program. And they actually asked uh, our consultant to try and use, help them use C to, to make some projections for their more, uh, new program, and that was done even in the pilot stage. So we, we look at this as having uh, a number of uh, applications. Uh, this is again just gives you a brief idea of uh, the, the real data needs. As I've already covered, it requires EMIS data, household survey data, and then you need local cost data. Uh, without the cost, local costs of what things, what you have to pay for in terms of books, it won't work. Uh, to give you an example, you know, in when we were piloting in Burkina Faso, there was no written cost data, but we had. Uh, the director for planning or the head of EMAS there, uh, and I think he was second or third in command within that ministry or department of education. So each time we needed some cost data, he would just pick up his phone and call somebody and they gave us that information. But we were saying, you know, in other cases we may not have that. So it's really important that you try to establish some estimate of, of cost, otherwise you can't use the model. Uh, I've added that, and it may not be in the slides you have, but that's the link to the uh, World Bank database. And I can share that with you. Uh, I'll send the link again. So, to come to the actual model, uh, if, as I said, you know, maybe I'm making an assumption again because I've been living this for a few months, uh, but it's very simple. It's, you know, if you have the five key areas. The, the, the gray area in the model looks at the bottleneck analysis. It just lists some of the possible kind of causes, barriers to access to learning, whatever, and you just click, and it will give you uh, some results on that uh, to help you identify which areas you want to introduce interventions to address. The, the other, in the actual interface, there are four key kind of areas. One is an area where you're setting your scenarios. It involves the assumptions you are making. It's about the sensitivity analysis and so on. The, the data and calculation page, there's a separate page where you have to enter all your data. In fact, that's where you will start. I think a week or two before you actually start the exercise, it, it's all about collecting, cleaning, and entering the data. And then you come back to the assumptions page, and then results and calculations are just generated as uh, result of the data you have and the scenarios you set. And we can look at some of those uh, in a little while. So this comes to the actual model. I don't know if, how many of you have had a chance to actually open the model in the link that I've sent, uh, that was sent or was it shared with you or not. But if you go to the model itself, uh, unfortunately I wasn't able to bring more than five copies because this is a pre-run that we did internally uh, for a workshop we had two weeks ago. But we hope to publish, have an external publication in about two to three weeks, so we may be able to get more copies of that. But everything that's in here is on that link. Uh, the actual model is an Excel file, and it's a step-by-step -step guide that actually walks you through it, and it sets a number of exercises which you can do. Uh, the data that we have in the model is all Ghana data, but you can remove all of the data, or save this, set a new scenario, a new page with whatever data. If you have data, all the required data for Tajikistan, you may then enter it and you could run the model. Uh, but it's fairly, uh, you know, I haven't been doing this and I didn't attend the training for, that was done two weeks ago. The last time I worked on it was 
I think uh, before June last year, I, a guy refreshed, did a bit of a refresh in my mind, and I followed the guy, which was written actually by Babette. And it's, you know, it's fairly simple to follow, at least from the front end user perspective. So just to give you an idea, uh, I think I'm already 30 minutes in, so I'll take about five minutes more. Uh, for just looking at this and then say one or two things about the Ghana data and those results. So maybe here yeah, what I will do is So this is the actual, if you, if, if you had followed the link, this is the actual Excel model itself. It's fairly, you know, uh, as I said, uh, we try to make it as user friendly as possible without going, so even if you don't want to go into the actual equations and so on, you'd be able to sit in front of the computer and run the projections as long as somebody entered the appropriate data for you. So it could be, even a, you know, a minister could sit there and try scenarios as long as uh, his technical people entered the data for it because the, the results that, that come out in the graphs are fairly easy to read. So it's uh, just to run through a couple of things. It's the first thing is you know if you see yeah we said you know it allows you to on the the menu is on the left and you can choose whatever you want to. It allows you. I think at the moment we have it on. Oh, we have it in Portuguese as well, but we definitely have it in French and English because most, as you know, most of the piloting was done in West Africa. Uh, then you can choose... Uh, you can choose... Oh, it runs. You can choose... Uh, simple C. So what we did, the simple C is... Uh, this was what I was saying, a more simplified version that could be used at sub-national levels. This was used by uh, the Ghana office to do some planning with one district. And we could take it even further to use it even at school level. So the next thing, uh, again, as I said, that one is just gives you some details about who developed it. Uh, about Ghana, some briefing, this is some core data, you need at least the core data uh, before you can even enter the rest of the data. Uh, this was this gives you this is the UNICEF monitoring new monitoring system that I spoke about the ten determinants across these four uh, domains. But uh, in most cases, other people using it in country would not need that. But that's for our own education offices. Similarly. Uh, with, with each of these, you can look at the sensitivity charts and so on. Uh, I think that's about all. Uh, as I said, we also uh, uh, linked it to our out of school study, so this would allow you to do something linked to that. But let's go back. The, the basic model, uh, everything is, is pretty simple, it's, it's by drop down menus. For example, the, the info section is where, which gives you either the intervention you want to fill in and so on. So, so once you choose your intervention and everything, once you click that, it will remove whatever pops up. So let's, let's choose, for example, this is, we, we tried to keep it, I think, in the case of Ghana, we limited it to about 15 interventions. We didn't want to try too many, and eventually in the pilot, we tried three or four. So basically, these are the type of, and these were based on what they were actually implementing in Ghana. We tried to keep it to whatever they are. So you have a choice. And the one in the uh, pilot study that we had, we looked at maybe preschools, we did things like, I think they, they did wing schools, are uh, schools that were 
from for grade one to three. They were more cluster-based schools that were closer to the village. And the ones we did was the kindergarten. That's the one you'll see in the pilot results. So even if you go to the link, uh, the results that are reported in the practice examples are all, that's one of the interventions that we'll show you. So that's the, the second thing. You need to set your start date. And in the results, I think the start date was 2012. You can project for how, whatever number of years. And I think in most cases, we chose 2015, either three year or five year time frames. So that, it's just a simple matter of entering the year. Similarly, your uh, end date of the completion. And the last intervention, number of units. In, in the kindergarten, what we did, uh, I think the, the issue was based on the, the analysis of the population, uh, the idea was to build 500 kindergartens. So the, the issue was putting in So that would be the total number. This is where you would have to choose your different type of targeting. In the case of Ghana, we did three, three levels of targeting. The first one we said, what if we distribute those evenly across the country? And what, we, what is the result in cost and the result in uh, the impact in terms of numbers of each, the, the cost benefit. The second that we, we tried was just uh, distributed between the north and the rest of Ghana to it. And the third was to select the poorest villages in the north. So, so there it's an even deeper level of targeting. I, I'm not, I, in the interest of time, I'm not going to be able to go through it. But you can try somewhere. And if you look at the, uh, those of you who don't get hard copy, if you go to the uh, link, there's a series of, uh, without having data, there's a series of practice activities which you can follow word for word and just open up the model and put in whatever you would like to try. And I think it's really, uh, if you do it you know, a couple of times, you should get quite uh, attuned to how it works. I think we can stop there. Unless, and then take some questions. I'm not going to answer any questions on the actual statistical <laughs> modeling and the, that kind of things, but the rest of it I could answer. Thank you, that was very um, so before you go on, yeah. and then we can, if we still have time, then I can talk a little more broadly about some of the other things on the set. Terrific. Action. I'm sure there will be questions about that too. So I have a question related to the, the model. Um, as he selected. Maybe we could have people introduce themselves. We might just say anything. Sorry, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right. a, a third year uh, doctoral student here at UPenn, also doing my master's in public health. Um, so my question is related to um, you selected. Um, girls in the north, which kind of for me reminded me of the, the geography or location is often the determinant of marginalization. Um, and to have it sort of in the title, you know, is interesting, but I wonder how much geography is included into the assumptions or like geospatial data well, well, in terms of clustering. Again, that the depends on the, on the availability of data. Yeah. In, in the case of Ghana, I think we have fairly good uh, district level data, at least down to the district level. And, and the reason we chose Ghana because, is because not only in terms of they've had the recent census and they do fairly detailed annual data collection, uh, both you know the, the government services themselves, but other agencies like World Bank, USA, there's major programs there. So there's a few different sources of data. Everything in a, in a sense for this model is data dependent. At least some key data. Uh, 
population data, especially broken down, right? Because we're looking at life cycles, you also have it needed to be broken down by those uh, cycles that correspond to, correspond to the life, school life cycle, maybe 0 to 4, 4 to 6, 6 to 12, whatever the case is. Otherwise, uh, it's a bit of a problem. And this is one of the issues that Matthew, who just joined a month ago, has raised. Uh, he's saying, you know, we have to try and simplify it. So, so we're looking at, at a few different kind of variations of the model and how it may be applied depending on the context. And if you look at the last slide, you know, it's, everything is about the context. So the regional uh, slicing of data is how to conform to it. But even, you know, and then in many countries, we, we, the other big question is everything in it, but is still largely property based. It's, and many countries you may not necessarily be able to get data about the fact So in some countries we were fortunate, and sometimes we may have to do some kind of estimation. Yes. Hello. You, you are. So, uh, my name is Priya Joshi, and I'm a doctoral candidate in education policy. <coughs> uh, my question is, I think I have two questions. One is on the issue on the modeling. Uh, like does the because as you mentioned, it has a lot to do with context and a lot to do with political economy. You know, Ghana is obviously a fairly well-functioning country in, you know, compared to a lot of other countries. Even the AMIS data might be much better than the other countries that, you know, sort of, let's say I looked at. Um, so in terms of the sensitivity analysis that you talked about very briefly, like how, what kinds of parameters are, do you, are in there, you know, to, like what are the macro micro dimensions, I guess? I is it like very complex? Is it? Yeah. I think, does it try to integrate uh, the political economy part? Like that, really? I, I don't think so. And okay. that's, that's one of the big challenges. One, mm -hmm. the two areas, even in our bottleneck analysis, I think I just opened. If you if you look at you know this is the interface page, and this is the bottleneck analysis. You'll see in the two areas that we don't have much data in most countries, even those that are well developed, are the areas of social norms and this whole enabling environment, whether it's the political economy and other questions. So, so that's an area where we still <coughs> are struggling on how we have to uh, develop uh, and how we will source data. Mm -hmm. Because particularly on the social norms, for example, with girls' issues, a number of them, exclusion, because of social norm issues, there's no real data on it. Because I feel like there's a lot of strong assumptions, right? Because the, yeah. I mean, there's like, in 10 years, exactly what will happen. I mean, the second question is um, really about the going from the access to the quality. And I feel like if you could sort of speak to um, the discussions you were having with the World Bank when you were debating on the, the gray matter, you know, the gray right. sort of interventions part. Like, so how did, how did like, sort of UNICEF contribute to what we know that the bank really focuses on, like performance pay, you know, privatization? There's a lot of things that, I think we where there are a lot of intervention data on. Yeah, and we, we yes. looked at what UNICEF was implementing mm -hmm. on the ground. So mm -hmm. the, if you look at the interventions paper that we have, mm -hmm. looks at what so-called great literature as well. Yeah. So there are many more of these community-based interventions by other NGOs, by UNICEF ourselves, by mm -hmm. community school models, which may not have had impact evaluations, but if, even if there was a kind of uh, self-assessment by that uh, NGO, we, we included some of those with all the caveats there. So, but, and this raises an important point, and, and this was the discussion we had in, uh, in Nigeria, was a lot of the discussion, even before we got to the modeling, most of the important discussion was at this stage of actually identifying those bottlenecks and barriers and then doing a causal analysis, because that's where you're going to set your assumptions. So I think the data, Challenge is a challenge, but it can be more easily dealt with in, you know, even using some tricks and so on. But it's this, these questions of you have to agree on the assumptions you are making. So that's the political dialogue that occurs before and after. Right, and that was actually going to be my question: is um, what's been has this been field tested? No. I mean, the, have you been out there plugging in things, or anybody been out there with a ministry actually yeah. doing this? Well, with these two, with Ghana and Burkina Faso, so that's how it has been done. With, with the ministry, with us, we had a team. For Ghana, it was myself, Babette, we had somebody from the World Bank, a 
V, I think, and then we have our country office there, and I think about eight or nine people from the ministry, from various sectors. Right, so I'm wondering, I guess, uh, and I can imagine, since it sounds like they were part of your effort to get, us, to get yeah. this going, so let's say you now go to Senegal, and you tell them that you've been to Ghana, and we had a great time, everybody was happy. Now we're visiting you, and here's the model. Uh, is there a sense that there would be resistance or 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 acceptance? There may be either way. So what do you think? I think I think the issue, what we are doing, is most of our country officers uh, are doing much more upstream policy work. So there's established relations with most ministries. And we are being very careful, rather than to make this uh, something that comes from the top, if there's demand from the, from the ground, then we would go to a country. Uh, noting that some of the countries are working on global partnership plans. So we are saying in your global partnership plan, if, if you're in a country where uh, inequality is a major issue, in developing your, your proposal, you could use this in helping you develop that. For instance, in Yemen at the moment, Yemen is going to submit uh, their GPE proposal on the fall of This is a global partnership for education. The global partnership for education sort of uh, is uh, funded by multilateral and bilateral donors. I think it has about two billion was pledged two years ago. It has money. And it is, you know, countries can apply for grants, small countries from like Comoros, uh, four, four million to but the ceiling for countries is 100 million, uh, which actually supplements their own sector plan. And Yemen, for example, we are working with the Yemen Ministry of Education because of the conflict and because of inequity and so on. They've also tried to use C in that case. So definitely we do not see this as something that we want to roll out because UNICEF has developed something. It's a tool that's available. If somebody wants to use it, we'll provide capacity. And the main idea is that and, and I think Matthew has also sort of uh, enabled us to really take account of the capacity gaps that exist. So one of the things he did, he's done, and he did this last week for an internal training, is before going into the sea itself, he's sort of developed a module that looks at policy analysis and even a simple Excel training for two hours. So in a ministry, the plan is we, even before you do the actual C work is to work for a week in, with an interest of ministry, do some general policy analysis, uh, skill building, do some Excel training, work with the data people there to enter the data over three or four days, clean up any data issues, look at the sensitivity analysis, uh, clear. then you have a policy dialogue around bottleneck analysis, and then you actually do C, so it's an involved process. And we don't have the capacity at the moment to do that, so it's going to be a big challenge. Well, and this is my follow-up to that, and, and maybe to open it up to what UNICEF's role is, sort of the, the second piece you wanted to talk about, or we wanted you to talk about. Because this presentation is very interesting uh, in, in that, uh, and even this document, which carries UNICEF and World Bank logo on it. And Priya's question, I think, is a very good question related to the point I'm about, or the question I would ask, and that is, this has a very bankish feel to it. It's not uh, a world bankish feel. And yet, you're representing UNICEF. You're also a person who's familiar with data. You're the right person, in a way, to lead a bridge. Maybe this new person is, too. But when you come in, it seems to me, and your response to my first question was, well, we have relationships. And that is one of the things that UNICEF has, maybe more than the bank has. The bank comes in, they send a group of consultants. I'm saying this partly because our group is interested in who does what. And so the bank would come in with a group of consultants and say, here's what you need to do uh, in order to get our money. UNICEF has a more proactive, closer in, the country officers, long time relationships, and so on. So in a sense, you're the soft end of what is a fairly hard edged, very assumption related and the interventions I think as Priya was implying, and I think that's true, most of the, I'm assuming that most of the interventions are, so far, yeah. 
from provided by the World Bank kind of data, which have their own set of assumptions and problems. So you're there using what might be a sort of bank-related set of data, dealing with people who are maybe hesitant to accept some of those bank assumptions. I don't know. No, that that's exactly the challenge, and I think you know I'm I'm going to go back to the uh, the Nigeria initial, and that's why the, the project stopped in some ways, and then there was changes in the government and so on, and we will revisit. But one of the people that that was there at the workshop, the initial to identify the bottlenecks and barriers, was a you may know him, uh, Obanya. Oh, sure. Right. So Former he, head of UNESCO. Yeah, he was representing Africa, the, the ministry because at that time they were developing a new plan or some strategic document for the president. But they had people from the uh, uh, from their statistics, uh, uh, national federal statistics bureau, and he questioned the entire model. Uh, you know, even the terminology he said it's you know you can't talk of commodities in education, or even the way the framing of the six. Uh, determinants. It's too stepwise and, and in education it's, it's not that way. So we, we are fully aware of that and I think that's the point is you have to be able to reach agreement through dialogue at that first stage. Then the application of the models and the interventions again it's, it's dependent on choices of what you're actually implementing rather than suggesting clearly something from elsewhere. Uh, so, so our process in facilitating it, uh, and, and this is, uh, again, for me, uh, a big challenge going forward, is as we do these rollouts and so on, it's going to, may turn into a very technocratic, external-driven process. Uh, because people may just see it as you know, developing capacity, training people to do modeling. So for us, I think the most important part is the dialogue to identify what are the real problems what are those fundamental causes? Because some of the things you can't even solve uh, in, 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 that are barriers to equality, which are outside the education system. So you do have to take into account all of that. So I think that's, I, I don't know which other way we'd be able to do it. So in a way, this is a basis for a conversation. You can debate whether the data are accurate yeah. or not. But at least you're talking about some data as opposed to opinion. Right. And then it also it gives you some kind of, at least for policymakers, some options of if you do this with this in mind, knowing that these are the assumptions you're making, this is the possibility. That's all it's really saying. But you then have to make a choice depending on what your end goals are, what your other political considerations and so on. So at both ends of the exercise, that dialogue is the most critical part of it. Sure. sure. Are we going to? Well, was Josh, your hand up over here? Uh, yeah. I mean, in your. Introduce yourself? Yeah, sorry. Uh, my name is Josh. Uh, we met at the train station. It's not my train. I'm also in IEDP. Um, what is your sense of the extent to which countries, you know, ministries of education, are, are interested in, in dialoguing around like, equity-based programming? I think more and more are, are interested in it purely because of the fact that we have proven to some extent there's been substantial gains, at least in enrollment, even in some countries in learning over the last decade. You know, the out-of-school numbers dropped from over 100 million to around 60 million in, in 10 years. But people have realized that in both in-country, uh, and this applies not only to uh, developing countries, but you know, middle-income and above countries, that there are large pockets of poverty and in substantial internal inequalities that need to be addressed. Otherwise, you know, reaching all remains unfinished business. I think that there's, there's some recognition about that. But then comes the question about the political will to increase, because people can go on saying that it's not about money, but in many cases you do have to increase domestic funding for education, otherwise you're not going to change anything. You know, I know there's a big uh, ministerial meeting being planned by the World Bank and Gordon Brown's office in April, and they're presenting things as, you know, uh, to find these solutions, three or four key solutions for some of the major problems. That's part of it. We do need to
to do business differently within education. We need to be more efficient. We need to find innovative ways of addressing certain problems, and they can be done. But technology is not the answer. You know, it's not the complete answer. It can help in certain ways. But in certain countries, if you don't increase the budget and use that money more efficiently, it's not going to make any difference. It, or it may make a little difference for some. I think that's, you know, there, there, some people have got it, but there's still a lot of, eventually I think it's the political will to make those changes. Can you say uh, a little bit now about the role that UNICEF plays in the matrix of international agencies? I mean, how do you see it? This is, a, this is I think, today as being um, both typical and atypical. You know, it has a little right. bankish, a little, sure. a little data no, driven, I, a little more than usually you find in the South and, and I'm not a data person. All my work, you know, until to, before I went to the doctoral program was totally qualitative. I was a policy <laughs> analysis, but qualitative. You know, I got burnt out between 94 and 98. I'm working with some of the Africana quantitative people and trying to change policy made me realize I needed to fill some of my quantitative gap. So that was one of the reasons for going back to school. Mm -hmm. I did do some quantitative work, but I never used it once I joined City. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so starting to work on this was you know, bringing me back a little. But I didn't do any of the actual hard quantitative work. It was more the conceptualization of linking. Uh, but I think it's an important skill to have. Right. So what is UNICEF? Uh, who don't, who only know that they collect money at certain times of the year. Uh, how would you say UNICEF today, from your perspective, you're in the education group, how is it positioned vis-a-vis, -vis, there are larger think tanks, there are people who have more money. Uh, what is UNICEF's role when you're at the table and you have the World Bank, you have UNESCO, you have ministers, you have this GPE, you have Hewlett Foundation, Gates Foundation, you're dealing with the, there, there's some heavy hitters out there. What does UNICEF try to do? What is it marginal? Benefit. Yeah. What? Benefit. Benefit. We're going back to the MBB model. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think, you know, UNICEF traditionally did a lot of uh, work on the ground in small projects supporting improvements, community school, our child friendly schools model has been, you know, popular for the last 10, 15 years, implemented maybe in one district in 20 schools in 50 countries. Over the last five years, I think, there was a kind of shift towards saying, with these, you know, new arrangements with the new international aid architecture and so on, that UNICEF could not continue to have an impact on education unless it got more engaged in the policy arena, being parts of the local education groups that are composed of the donors, the government, other actors, and played a more proactive role in that. Uh, the, 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 the thing was that you'd have to, you can't give up all of your on-the-ground work. You may need to continue to that to have some degree of authenticity. And I think UNICEF <coughs> made this kind of leap to say, we will continue to do that, but that won't be the only work we will do. And we'll do that in only certain cases, not to be doing implementation of little projects all over the place as we have done in the past. Some countries still do so because funding streams are very different. They, they collect, they may receive funding from a particular uh, UNICEF fund in Belgium and they may insist on doing it, but we've tried to discourage that. So, so I think to answer the question, UNICEF sees its role as acting as a kind of, in some cases, a honest broker to helping people to see, focus more on those issues we think that are important for children. I think it goes back to UNICEF's initial mandate in terms of a human rights organization because in many of these discussions, they become so uh, involved in systemic change and sector planning and so on that children, you know, in some discussions, children never get mentioned. So one of the roles I think UNICEF says is we have to continue to ensure that children remain at the center of all discussions. How do we do that? What's our kind of value? I think is building on uh, the trust and the relationships that we have uh, over time. We bring that to bear, and, and we still have a, a significant presence in the country, in many countries. Uh, that, and I think 
in terms of what we've now done, and that's where you see this link to the bank, is in a sense, one of the things that was pushing us was that much of our programming was often very loosely designed, not based on evidence in many cases. We just tried things. So one of the things we are saying, even if we do small projects, they have to be evidence-based, and not necessarily always you know, impact evaluations and so on, but the evidence that can be derived from local knowledge and so on. And, and this is the other important point. Whenever a choice of another uh, program from another country, it has to be considered whether it's locally applicable. You know, everybody has said we've all encouraged uh, cash transfers, conditional or otherwise, based on one big success, Progressa. You know, the operationalization is all that matters, not necessarily the design. And in many cases, how it's operationalized has led to failure. So that's another, I think, value for UNICEF. It has shown that on the ground, it can, it can bring in some of this local knowledge to help support more effective operationalization plan. plan. The third area, I think, where UNICEF is really involved in now is maybe by default from GPE, is that we are working in a number of uh, conflict-affected countries. The biggest challenge in meeting the MDG, Millennium Development Goals, or EFA Goals, is 28 of those 61 million are located in countries affected by conflict. And we have a major presence. We have, uh, actually, we have a major project funded by the Dutch. Uh, it's $115 million in 13 countries, which is an education and peace building program. So, so I think there's a few different areas, but largely I think it's eventually much to deal with relationships. It's how, you know, to give you the example, in some cases where we are in a local education group, we've only contributed maybe $10,000 to that country grant, but we are invited to the table. So I think it's, I don't know how long that will continue, but, uh, given the way the global partnership works, but we are, implementing partner with government in a number of global partnership countries. Yeah. I was wondering if Ashland is an IEP or well, the IEP program. Um, and based on what you just said in your C presentation, I'm wondering what your expectation is um, about how heavily this tool will be used to sort of help determine where UNICEF might take its next steps or the projects that it chooses to do. Well, I think it's both to help UNICEF determine where it will focus in the country. Because we are saying, you know, if we if we work in country, there's a mandate from the executive director to address the marginalized. There's a commitment that over even we are currently working on our new medium term uh, plan, which will run from 2014 to 2017. There's a specific global target to address the marginalized across all sectors, health, child protection, education, nutrition, uh, ECB, uh, gender, whatever. So, so that's clearly something in country officers doing their own plans, they will have to use some form of bottleneck analysis, be it C or other model that they choose to, to determine country plan. Then it's part of the advocacy to make it available to government like, as a partner in their own plan, in their own sector plan. It's not a replacement. And we don't see it as a hard tool to be used to make you know, real hard economic decisions, but more the dialogue. If it can be used, and they're willing to use it to make some financial decisions, all the better. But at least to get that, I think in many countries, even that first step, you know, although we are seeing changes, to get more seriously involved, because the, the biggest response you get from most governments, finance ministers or education ministers, that's a hard to reach place. Those are hard to reach. It's more costly. It's more expensive. So we are looking at this also not only as a dialogue tool, but as an advocacy tool to say, no, it is not as costly. In the longer term, it is less costly. If you invest now, you will see the return over time. So that's another purpose of it. That's good. I mean, uh, uh, I'm Ryan. I'm sorry, you're the management and evaluation program at GSC. So I'm interested in the validity of the model. Have you ever seen that more affecting the predictive power of the company? Say? No. And that's that's the issue that we face over the next year. That's why, in a sense, we see this still as a pilot. 
So, so it's, it's, you know, we still have to do two more pilots in, as I said, in uh, Thailand and Cambodia, and part of that will be the testing. That, yeah. I said maybe you can run the model, say, using the 2005 data, project something in 2010, right. and pass the results with the actual. Yeah, numbers. I think that that's the plan. Because right now, basically, you know, until Matthew's coming on board uh, a month ago, and then we have another colleague, you know, Shireen, who just joined as well, about the same time as at the headquarters, it was just myself and the consultant. And then we had, you know, our Ghana office here. So it's basically three people working on and with some support from the bank, which is very minimal, uh, in, in surprisingly, because Emilio left after two months and they hadn't filled that post. So we did most, almost 90% of the development work. So, oh, maybe one last question. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Molly, I'm a master's student in the International Education Development Program. Um, we had earlier in the school year Elizabeth King come and talk, and she spoke for a little bit about their Saber or Saber yes. tool, tool. How do you compare or contrast the C tool with that? Well, I think I think the Saber uh, is a much more system-wide approach, and you know they produce uh, school report cards, national report cards, and so on. But there's some linkage. So even in the development of this model, the Saber team did not actually talk to us because the Saber team at that point was uh, led by Emilio. Vega. And so, in a way, we are hoping that there will be more connections with Matthew coming on board because Matthew worked on both ends of the scale. But that's something we never really spoke about. But there are connections because a lot of their equity work is driven through Seba. But it sounds like this is more intervention. Yeah. Focus where that is more. Much more. Getting system. a state yeah. of the situation. Well, I think we have to stop there. He's got another. Uh, but I want to say a couple of things. One is I still have these five copies to get them you get up here quickly. I also need to say that um, uh, this, uh, our speaker today, uh, Dr. Naidu, uh, is uh, principally sponsored by the IEP, but also by the Andrew School of Communications, their global center on communications. And I need to mention also, as I was hearing you say how understaffed you are sometimes, that we are developing a relationship, we meaning the IEP, with UNICEF to provide interns uh, both in country offices, maybe regional offices. I hear that is prominent applause for what I'm saying. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm thinking that if you have trouble doing data analyses in New York, we may have people here who can maybe pitch in as part of our relationship that is beginning to blossom. And then the final thing to say is many thanks for a most interesting presentation. Um, this could go on a while, and I think there's a bunch that's going to happen, and maybe we'll go on there. But uh, thank you very much for joining us today. I think we've been trying to set this up for over a year. Both of us, uh, I think me, I've been traveling quite a bit you more more than the me. last six months. So, uh, and actually, even at the last moment, another meeting was scheduled just a week ago uh, in DC this morning, and I finally got somebody else to go. And I said, I'll put this off again. I don't know when I'll be available. So, <laughs> We're delighted to So I'm, I'm very glad to be here to have been here. And I think uh, not <laughs> and, uh, uh, before we run out, if anybody has a particular thing informally uh, that you'd like to talk with uh, George about, please tell us.